Kia ora koutou katoa. Welcome to The Hoon, where co-host Peter Bale and I go around the week's news in geopolitics and Aotearoa's political economy with a whole bunch of experts, academics and politicians, all to understand our worlds better and have some fun. Koto Kato, it's fantastic to see you all here on this Thursday evening. Um, before a, a, a good break, I hope you all managed to get a good break over Easter. It's been a heck of a week, actually, uh, in many ways. Uh, Peter, lovely to see you there in, in an unusual background. I have got an unusual background, Bernard. I'm in a bookshop. I was going to say that I've become one of those old men who comes and sits in the libraries and you know talks to himself, but instead... Uh, I mean, it's not a million miles away from that. Uh, I'm uh, helping a friend run his bookshop while he's away in Jervoice Road. And it's moderately amusing. I've um, sold a few books today and uh, you sold managed some books. to avoid... Fantastic. Absolutely. The last, I've sold several... I've sold quite a few books, thank you very much, Bernard. <laughs> and I've managed to do it so far without jumping over the, um, over the counter and insisting that people buy whatever I've read, read most recently. Um, but I, I have had to read the New York Times 100 Best Books of last year in order to be able to talk knowledgeably about the um, novel selection because I'm a bit, a bit more of a, a non-fiction boy myself. Yeah, I can't remember the last time I read a novel. It's a bit sad, isn't it? And, um, yeah, no, well, it is, I think there was a moment, and I, of course, have great conversations with fellow boomers, uh, not just bo- uh, the other, Last week I described myself as boomer adjacent. And a little shit I know called Rosa, who is a lovely young woman, dropped me a note saying, Adjacent, you're right in it, mate. So um, <laughs> if, if Rosa's listening, thank you very much for that, uh, for identifying correctly that I am, in fact, a boomer. But I think there is a phase with boomers, Bernard, where we, boomer men at least, where we really start focusing on nonfiction, partly to cram our brains full of whatever they missed on the way through till boomerhood. Yes. Or is yes, that just I'm me? Sure there's- no, no, I suspect, you know, once once we're in the empty, empty nest phase, we have to keep ourselves busy, otherwise it all goes bad. And yeah. um, I think uh, we're, we're doing a pretty good job of that. Um, the key thing uh, when you're in that phase is to um, stay healthy and uh, host a podcast. I think that is the way to go. And well, exactly, exactly. It's, it's exactly what I've been saying to all the boomers. And But I was speaking to another boomer today, Penny Holtz, who I, next this week, rather, who... I believe is the mm. former mayor of former deputy mayor of Waitakere, and I was well, talking to Well, she was the her. mayor of Waitakere and the deputy mayor. I that's right. I forgive me. That's right. Yeah, yeah. and uh, she's a terrific person. And she was. Uh, I was talking to her for a project I'm working on for Sir Peter Gluckman about media. And apart from having a fantastic reminiscence about my time as a reporter for the Western Leader uh, in the late <laughs> 1870s, when I used to take my dray horse out to Titarangi to do the stories out there. Um, she said, oh, you know, journalism in New Zealand, this, this and that. And she said, but at least there's Bernard Hickey in the sub step. I'm, you know, he's, I start, he's my starter every day. And I said, oh, that's interesting. Do you know that Bernard and I do a podcast every... And she said, oh, I listen every week. So here you go. She, she listens <laughs> well, to Penny. you, thinks you're a bit too negative sometimes about, you know, like about the position and could possibly be more generous to politicians and people trying to do important things. But... If you read the report, that's what I'm going to try and say is her view of New Zealand media, that we need to be positive as well as holding power to account. Yeah, I think that's it's a fair thing. I'm a fan of uh, Penny and the work she did. Um, she, I think, is one of those um, you can count as uh, one of the heroes in the Auckland Unitary Plan debate yeah. of 2016, which I think when we look back on it is a seminal moment, actually, not only for Auckland, but for <clears throat> New Zealand. Uh, and you can see that now with the uh, reports and papers that are coming out looking at what happened to housing affordability, mm-hmm. to rents in Auckland versus the rest of the country, showing that upzoning does work to improve affordability. Now, it's not as much as it, as it should be. And it's interesting, there's been a lot of attention paid internationally to these reports. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, I think it was very interesting you had that guy Stu on as well. Mm. Mm. Yeah. But are we going to um, are we going to do anything with them, Bernard, or is it going to be messed up by the by the short term short termism and three year political cycle of New Zealand? Yeah. Well, this is the problem, uh, and in fact, there, there's been some setbacks this week. Um, Auckland has been given mm-hmm. um, more time to 
uh, uh, update its district plan, which includes uh, more upzoning, so more time for councils to look to opt out. Um, the new government mm -hmm. under Chris Bishop, who paints himself as a an upzoner, uh, as a, a, a libertarian style, <clears throat> flood the market with houses and watch the prices mm. fall in income adjusted terms. <laughs> mm. But, um, but he's also the one who's who's had to cave in to the the Blueprints Brigade and National Act and New Zealand First, who do not want anyone living near them. Yeah, so, as someone um, as someone said in our comments last week, a men wearing blue rinse at National now. Well, After you yeah, used that, that phrase <laughs> last time, but yeah, <laughs> yeah there's I'm tempted. I tell you, too. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that would be quite a sight on the hoon for the for those. Oh, I think I might. Do, My uh, friend Nick Jones does that, so I, I might have to. I might have to do that. Put a bit of a whiff. Of, it's a, put a bit of a whiff of blue in my quiff. Yeah, a whiff of blue in your quiff. That it's because um, um, un, un, very good. Unkindly, I think uh, Bernard, and possibly because of my quiff and my um, my forehead, uh, people have been comparing me to Bill Bailey in Black Books which apparently is a scene of utter chaos in the in that series but um you know the bookshop is much better ordered and has a very impressive array of coffee table books if anybody would like to come in and say hello yeah no i can see uh, a black box uh, uh vibe going on there um peter um interesting to see plenty of uh, news in the media uh, this this week uh we're getting and close about the to media the... yeah yeah now we're getting close to the April 10 deadline on whether we, whether we we see the confirmation that News Hub is uh, going or not. I hear from yeah, and you just you just around. told me you had some thoughts about that. What's what's going on with that? Do you want to my reveal? My understanding them? is my understanding is that Discovery, who had previously said they were just going to shut down News Hub, uh, have taken another look at this and said, mm, maybe we could get someone to produce a news show for us. Mm. Mm. for a certain amount, maybe $10 million. Mm. And uh, my understanding is that obviously there's a group of people in and around News Hub who'd like to, you know, come up with a slimmed down version to do it separately. Uh, NZME and stuff are looking at it. And uh, we'll see whether... Oh, good. That's, that's the guarantee of success then. Yep. And uh, so we'll see whether competition is uh, reduced or not. Because one of the risks here is that NZME grab it and so we go from um, you know five newsrooms down to four or whatever it is, and NZME's uh, strength extends from uh, newspapers and radio, but also to television. I'm probably the only journalist in the country who uh, has a view that the NZME stuff merger was a bad idea, and uh, this would be one of those. But then again, um, there's a whole bunch of journalists who'd quite like to keep their jobs, so I'm, I'm sympathetic to that as well it's going to be a busy one um peter I'm going yeah to there's also been a Catherine. phenomenal number just just thinking about about the media sure. bernard and i i do have something i will have something to say to you soon about um about that uh, news hub thing in fact I, I might ring you tonight because i've got a i've got a a cunning plan myself but um do you have a cunning uh, 10 million dollars spare a cunning a cunning 10 well i mean we can barely get the hoon done for 10 million a year bernard i mean <laughs> this is without with i mean with what simon charges us to do the absolutely superb production <laughs> and what lynn charges you for the carpet photographs i mean you know we haven't got much change out of six million True. Uh, and yeah. that's not tv usually but i was also struck just on the media side before we go to go to uh, catherine this week another one of these kind of weird meme slash bandwagons two of them three of them actually that came up this week one was the dolphins the hector's dolphins and how many had to be to be endangered and how big a prick russell coots had to be in order to say he couldn't believe that the iwi was allowed to basically run dock which i thought was pretty obnoxious given that he had um you know he uh, he doesn't exactly has it have a great uh, reputation as a new zealand patriot um and then there was this nonsense in my opinion with the uh, destiny church uh, and it would appear both in gisborne and in um, karanga happy road with the rainbow crossings and then you've got this uh, winston and david seymour diving into this silly story about a room set aside for pacifica and maori students at auckland university which has apparently been there for years and i thought chloe swarbrick Makes a re who has been on the pod, of course, made a really amazingly good point today about 
the responsibility of leading politicians not to dive into every mo every meme and uh, jump onto every bandwagon and to really think about these, as, as she put it, these overseas imported controversies. And I think that's particularly the case with the Destiny Church one and this idea of segregation. We, we have to be really careful. And there's a very high level of irresponsibility at the moment, it seems to me. And a lack of impulse control, I think. Correct. Um, and Correct. also, frankly, these guys are busy, okay? You know, Winston Peters has had one of the busiest and most historic weeks of the year as foreign minister. He should have been up yeah. to his eyeballs and briefing papers and meetings with officials to make sure that we didn't wreck our main trading relationship. For him to be racing off and, and um, blathering on about not only... Yeah, um, he's trying um, to out David uh, Seymour. David Seymour is the problem, you know. And, he, and talk about distractions. We've got uh, rainbow-coloured um, crossings. Uh, he had a go at the, the dolphins as well. And then as, uh, when he had some spare time, had a spray at the serious fraud office. Um, yes, well, I'm, I was thinking, shall we get to, shall we, why don't we get Lynn over and we can paint some Hector's dolphins onto the, um, onto the rainbow crossings? Or maybe actually because exactly. they're black and white, or they were black, should be black and white, of course. We could put some orcas on there. Which, as someone once yeah. said, the, the, the rebranding of killer whales as orca is, is one of the great global rebranding success stories. Catherine, you take it over. PR yeah, genius. No, <laughs> it, is, it is indeed the case. Uh, Catherine, lovely to see you um, again. It's, uh, it's been a big week for those who have to think about the effects of climate change in Aotearoa with the big report out on how prepared we were for Cyclone Gabrielle and how well our emergency management dealt with the most extreme event, which we know with the climate warming is going to be a lot more frequent and a lot more extreme. So what, what did we hear from this uh, Mike Bush report into our preparedness for Gabrielle? So this report was looking at um, civil defence and emergency management in Hawke's Bay in particular. So Mike Bush has already led a report that looked into um, Cyclone Gabrielle's effects in Auckland, and this one was specifically on the Hawke's Bay. Um, but a lot of what's coming out of that report in terms of learnings is pretty similar, um, and, and also the same as what's come out in preview, previous reports from other um, disasters that have occurred. Um, first of all, the main one is that... Um, uh, um, so the National Emergency Management System is not fit for purpose um, and that should be worrying when you're starting to hear that for the third or fourth time from an account from a from a um, from a mm. report coming out of a situation like that 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 is still the same and hasn't no, no progress has been made is is particularly worrying um, but one of the, the things that I was most interested in looking at were so, some of the bigger systemic effects. So I, I don't, I, it was less to do with necessarily individuals on the ground um, at the time and how they manage things, um, and a lot to do with some of the systemic failures that, that meant that they weren't um, prepared well enough, didn't have the right training, didn't have the mm. right um, things in place to deal with it. And, the, and then those sort of failures in the mo moment come out of those things. So there were two um, big learnings that I took out of that report that I found particularly resonant. Um, the first one was to do with uh, approaches to and treatment of climate risk. Mm -hmm. um, and the second one was to do with the treatment of indigenous networks and knowledge systems. Uh, um, and both of those two um, situations apply across several reports and several um, disasters that have happened. Um, in particular, when it came to climate risk, um, in the report, um, some of the things they said were that the CDEM staff were overconfident. They <coughs> tended to have an optimism bias um, where they tended to take a best case scenario rather than a precautionary approach to planning, communication and warnings and that they didn't have enough of a scenario planning mindset. Mm. So these are all about how you how you manage risk in an environment where you're expecting to see more, more extreme weather events. Yeah, but Catherine, there. she'll be right. Yeah. She'll be right. <laughs> well, and, and what happened is that a lot of, to fill the gap, gaps, you get a lot of volunteers having to step in who are, you know, underfunded and undersupported and under a lot of stress and doing heroic th things at the time, um, but also becoming quite disenchanted with, 
with the response that they got and mm. the lack of appreciation mm. that they got and the lack of respect that they got. And this was particularly the case for iwi um, and um, for Māori in general in the, in the sense that they were able to jump in and fill a lot of gaps, but they mm. were also um, not really show, showing a great deal of respect and trust. They haven't been brought into the system early on, so they haven't. Um, there hasn't been any training or networks been set up with them, um, and and their advice was not really How taken often on the ground. And so, you know, what this report is saying out of that as well is is you know, that there is a real leadership role being played there and there is some real um, great um, local knowledge, deep local knowledge and good networks and resources in place. All of these things that you would really hope that the country would be able to properly kind of acknowledge and support and learn from and that we're not really doing that. My uh, recollection, Catherine, was that the East Cape, uh, a lot of people in the East Cape, like Tolaga Bay and so on, who were very, very badly affected by... Oh, we seem to have lost Peter. Mm -hmm. You know, the Marae were absolutely central. Sorry, the Marae were absolutely central to, um, you know, looking after people, to the provision of food, to you know, using meeting houses for what, for, for you know, community as community centres. Um, that does seem very short-sighted. But I, I wonder, Catherine, whether, I mean, I, may, I joked about she'll be right, but that is still quite a uh, strong New Zealand vibe that when, when things go wrong, it's amateurs who pick up the slack you get that. What, what was it? The Coast Guard or the, the Coast Guard did not have any, or um, you know, the lack the lack of uh, inshore boats uh, and and ribs and so on to be able to get out to the cops quickly. You know, we've got some experience with this now. Yeah, uh, um, that's absolutely the case. That we have a, a, a really strong reliance on on volunteer networks or non profit mm. networks or, or whatever, but also. <laughs> Um, Bernard, you had a view on this about efficiency and and how that might have um, played a role in in um, I guess this drive for efficiency all the t time can, from a systems perspective, can reduce your resiliency because you take all of the all of the um, you know in terms of stocks and flows you take out inventories and you take out waste areas and you take out things that can pick up slack when things go go wrong or when mm. you know yes. Uh, essentially, um, what it tells us is that our 30-year drive for efficiency to remove waste, to take the fat out, meant that when we were under stress, when an, a shocking event happened, we didn't have the fat. There was no resiliency. Um, for example, one bridge going out took out water, power, mm. telecommunications, broadband, which meant that the entire East Coast had no way to transact. It's, it's interesting to see the Reserve Bank's um, complete shock at the way that the banking system, but also government mm. departments and others, have prioritised efficiency and uh, removing waste and, and being just in time at the expense of being just in case. And this is uh, something that... Oh, oh I, think, I like that. Uh, we've got... Did, yeah, was that the phrase no, they I used? Mean, yeah, so, I, I suspect um, that, yeah. that that's even from a global perspective during COVID when all the supply chains went down that, that, that there's been an international learning around the sense that you need to have a bit more just in case there, you need to mm. have a bit more slack in the system to be able to stretch a bit when things, you know, when, when mm. the situation changes. Do you want to hear a really good, um, another really good uh, she'll be right thing, which is quite topical? So a friend yeah. of mine is a journalist at the Baltimore, used to be a journalist at the Baltimore Sun, which you might remember was the oh, newspaper yeah. that was featured in The Wire, which you know, was probably the greatest television mm. show ever made. And he sent me a story from May the 10th, 1980. Direct hit would topple Maryland bridge spans, official says. <laughs> Neither the Key nor the Chesapeake Bay bridges could withstand the direct impact of a ship comparable in size to a 600 foot freighter that hit the Tampa Bay Bridge yesterday blah, 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 blah. I would have to say that if a ship hit the Bay Bridge or the Key Bridge about the main support, a direct hit, it would knock it down. Whatever unit got struck, that section would be knocked down. And as we know, that happened this week, of course. Um, you know, pretty shocking and extraordinary footage, but, uh, you know, a, a great reminder to us all. And apparently, according to that story, which, which is, as I say, since 1980, the, these bridges are protected by what are called um, dolphins, not Hector's dolphins, but concrete structures that are sacrificed 
uh, before, theoretically before they hit the uprights of the bridge, hit the supports mm. of the bridge. But they appear not to have been enough to have dealt with the, uh, the Dali uh, this week. I mean, really yeah. extraordinary to see that footage. Yeah, and, I, and what that I heard was that when they... Result... Sorry, when they designed go, on those bridges, that those big super tankers didn't actually exist. Like the super super so container huge. ships, yes, absolutely, yeah, yeah, all yeah. containers, yeah, mm-hmm. but both, yeah. yeah, that's that's true, and I'm sure they weren't that big in 1980 as well. I mean, this one was one of those. I think they're called a, a super Pan American because it uh, it was designed for new locks uh, that were released into the into the uh, you know created at the Panama Canal. Um, you know, and this is this is I think 80 percent of U.S. car imports come through Baltimore. Uh, coal exports it's a it's a remarkably important and of also having driven over this a few times it's the you know it's the main artery from one end of the city and on the i-95 which is the main road up the east coast and that means so, and that means they, they won't be built for a decade and that means hmm. a complete shift in that the entire local economy there that's right. what it also right. tells us is that um those panamax um massive projects panamax, they're called that's it. yeah Panam Pana because they're talking about the Panama Canal, yep. which climate change is drying up to the point where it's really affecting uh, all of those um, those ships trying to get through there. It's limiting the number of ships. It's increasing the costs. I must say, over the last three four years, my views on on the long term trajectory for inflation um, are starting to shift around how COVID and climate change is. Uh, reducing the benefits of efficiency, which often fall to low inflation. Mm-hmm. And now some of that uh, fat is being built back into the system and it's coming back as inflation. Interesting. Which is, uh, That's exactly the conversation I was having last night with somebody that this is this is almost mm. certainly linked to global inflation, you know, that that, mm. that fat is being built back in at the moment. And I think, though, yeah. in the in the long run, if we don't start to get get our heads around the reality of these hits that are going to keep coming, and how we continue to build up that. And, and in fact, the need to continue to build more resiliency into the system is probably going to mean that those that impact on inflation is, is here f- for a long time to come because we still have a long way to go. Well, I'm sure we learned all yes. the lessons from the um, B, B, BP Deep Horizon. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean yeah. that was a that was no, a and we didn't. This is the event. problem. It's not at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, so to, can, to answer can, Penny's can, question, then what what can we say? What can Catherine and you say that might be positive? You know, if they think about over Easter, that we might, you know, is there something we can do? Are we feeling positive? What what can we feel positive about? Apart from I being well, by um, minute. <laughs> I think the big thing for me is that they're starting to get this focus on what are the networks and communities and how do they you know how do we build in the resilience at that level and that involves you know everybody that involves all of us you know it works down to our level so i think that there's there's a lot that can be done there and i also think that the things that they look at they're saying that need to change like systems and 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 so on those are really important pivot points so i think that this area is a really important thing to focus on and to mm-hmm. agitate in and to and to demand change um from policy makers and from government because those this is you know some of the changes are around the culture the way we think about things yeah, as well so yeah, they, exactly. these are critical exactly. tipping points these are social tipping points so i think this is stuff that is really important and really important to get involved in yeah mm, thank you i i do have a positive thing to say and um, excellent penny's right and and i've been enthused in the last week after a discussion with mike casey who is the ceo of rewiring aotearoa it was a, a podcast that is going out um, this week, looking at the electrification tipping point, point for the costs of converting your house to solar and batteries. Uh, they estimate yep. that we are now at the point, because of the falling cost of panels and batteries, where if you can get a loan uh, for the regular cost of a mortgage, then it makes sense now, economically, to, to convert your house to solar with batteries and to buy an electric car to rip out your gas appliances and to shift to being completely electric. Still cool. I'll be able to, to buy grid. everybody's cheap, cheap cars and gas appliances and uh, and and get a new <sighs> log fire and a and a and a jacuzzi. And Peter, all of that is good for the... local resiliency as well. By the way, exactly. Yeah, I mean, uh, the one thing that struck me after looking at this Gabriel report is that every single marae in rural New Zealand mm. should be covered in solar panels so that when this thing happens 
people can go there and charge their phones and and run whatever they need to to do because push comes to shove in gabriel people went to marae because they were yes, one they of did. those yeah renewable community energy community. on marae 100 percent. yeah excellent yeah good oh that is positive so we go, jesus Penny. christ uh, now we'll go negative with we're going ne- we've been positive we'll go negative with uh, <laughs> professor patman <laughs> See you later. Thank you. And- yeah. Bye, Catherine. Thank you. Bye, Bye, Catherine. <clears throat> Professor Bye. Patman, it's so good to see you. You're so kind to, to, to come on with us again. I thought we might start with um, with Russia and Vladimir Putin. And uh, I think I sent you the thing I wrote today. I did. Sorry, I, I was having my back no, rearranged, no, no. but I did read it. No worries. No worries. Um, you probably need your head rearranged afterwards. But <laughs> yeah, what, what's your what's your thinking about the uh, the Putin strategy here or the lack of a strategy or how that attack has potentially derailed him at exactly a critical moment it uh it's certainly a dangerous moment for putin actually and uh it was interesting that he's had to retreat from his initial narrative which was to say it was all down to ukraine and they had intercepted the fleeing attackers just short of the ukrainian border which is one of the most fortified areas (laughs) of the russian federation Mm. which didn't make a lot of sense um it is an extraordinary episode, though, when you think how fortified uh, Moscow is. And here we have this um, Crocus City Hall uh, and the security apparently were stood down at seven o'clock in the evening. Hmm. And uh, they had an armory there. Uh, the Crocus Hall had their own armory um, to deal with situations like this. So and then, of course, when the call did go out, when the terrorist attack began, it took an hour and a half of Putin's National Guard to arrive. So it's a very strange situation. And of course, as we all know, people have been arrested at the drop of a hat for talking about an invasion or even mm. put, holding up pieces of paper within minutes. And this is an extraordinary anomaly. It, it It's either incompetence and that, as somebody has said, that Putin is so fixated with the war that he's underestimated the threat from ISIS. But... That in itself doesn't add up, even if he was underestimating the threat from ISIS. Putin has never been relaxed or complacent against the security threats to him personally. Mm. Uh, So I'm really having trouble understanding this. Um, And it would appear that the ISIS case seems to be the most plausible explanation, as you pointed out in your article, Peter. And I um, I think that's absolutely bang on. I mean, I, I think that... ISIS K have been gunning from all accounts for Putin for about two years. So, mm. um, and and becoming increased. I mean, it was interesting that, that, that I think I think I sent you a piece today from the Financial Times that the extent to which ISIS K has been built, which is the Khoras- Khorasan mm. the district, or the, they're trying to create a caliphate that would cover Afghanistan, parts of north of India, Pakistan. Same old story about about you know recreating mm. or creating a new caliphate. And they've really moved in extraordinarily into uh, Afghanistan since the Taliban took over and are very much behind a lot of these attacks on the Shia uh, in in um, Afghanistan. And, of course, attacks the that rather nasty attack at a, at a, site, a Shia site at a funeral in um, Iran. But yes. It was also just and again, one of the points I was trying to make in that article was about disinformation and how Putin is sort of the world expert of that. But one potentially reliable thing I picked up on, on, on X was this week amongst the desert of crap was that there seems to be a, a, a strong belief that the, there are pictures of the FSC, FSB person who, um, who arrested one of the um, torturers, I'm sorry, one of the prisoners on the way to uh, Belarus, perhaps, uh, was actually present in the Yes, but that's now, been, uh, that's now Debunked, been has it? discredited by Bellingcat. Oh, good. I'm and so the gentleman, can, the gentleman who was widely regarded to be a member of the FBS or SB, FSB. Or S, yeah, FSB. I'm sorry. Um, okay, we can. He, 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 he apparently turns for... out to be an oil worker and is very indignant. And um, excellent. Um, but Bellingcat has said that unfortunately is not true oh, about good. I the, feel fir- the links. But I the one thing you are raising, which is really extraordinary, and I find it difficult to answer, people have put forward the case that uh, the FSB may not have been responsible for this appalling terror attack, which has taken more than 130 lives, but they did little to stop it until very late in the day. And that is very difficult to, you know, work that out, really. Mm, mm. But um, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, we won't get a true picture for a while, but I, I, I do think that Russia's involvement against ISIS in Syria, uh, Bikuna, Faso, uh, Mali, has accumulated quite a few um, enemies on his part or, or in ISIS. And of course, as you rightly say, ISIS-K has now carved out a safe haven in Afghanistan and have been completely overpowering the Taliban government who can't mm. cope with them. So this is an extraordinary situation. And um, uh, yeah, uh, Al-Qaeda are linked to Taliban, but they, the combined forces of Al-Qaeda and the Taliban can't seem to cope with uh, ISIS-K. And uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it, I still think, however, you know, much of Mr. Putin's leverage domestically is based on the fact he may be a so-called strong man, who does unpleasant things to his opponents, but the promise and the contract with the Russian people is that he can keep the place safe. Well, That's unfortunately, right. that doesn't look particularly credible at the moment. The other thing that must be worrying him greatly, which is not getting the headlines, has been the systematic night, day, night after night attacks on Russian facilities by drones. Mm. And this is just cumulative. 21 attacks on oil refineries in the last... Uh, three weeks, almost one and more than one a night, basically. So, I, I think this combination of things makes Putin look a bit vulnerable. There may be Putin. Uh, somebody said quite shrewdly, um, and I think it was Galliotti, Mark Galliotti, who said that the, the things he wants to fear now is someone within his own entourage who believes that Putin can no longer deliver protect the exactly security, the and that maybe they can do it better than he can. So yeah, there's a very interesting question too, Robert. Um, speaking of Putin being being not entirely kind to people, um, from our listener IP67, who's who's commented before, um, noting that the the, the prisoners had um, some fairly serious injuries um, when they were displayed in court, particularly the poor bugger who, who'd had his ear chopped off during mm. um, I, it's appalling. interrogation. I mean, this is a gangster regime. There's no even attempt to. You know, really what Putin's saying is that I'm the mob boss. Anybody gets in my way gets the treatment. You don't cross the Don. And uh, if you if you do cross us, this is what happens to you. And these people are proudly displayed, you know, almost comatose. And it, it, it's there's no attempt uh, to present a system based on the rule of law. Robert, I wonder if um, with the signs of uh, protests that were evident uh, to commemorate the death of... Navalny, whether Russians uh, will see, and it's hard to avoid, that um, a man running their country who has said, I'm all about security and keeping you safe, couldn't keep them safe in one of the most um, public and prominent places in the, in the country, in the middle of Moscow. Uh, is there any chance people are going to look at the emperor and says, he's got no clothes, I've had enough of this? Mm. It's a tough question, though, um, Bernard, because I think Putin operates with enormous fear. He's utterly ruthless. And I think in the West completely underestimates how ruthless he is. And as David Satter, you quoted in a recent article, Peter, pointed out, he doesn't hesitate to murder people who threaten him internally. It's just on this occasion, he apparently was not in on the job. So uh, it doesn't mean he won't. And of course, Russians know this. Um so I, I, I think it's going to take some momentum or some demonstrated defiance before we see that sort of grassroots movement against him. I hope I'm mm. wrong, because I, I do think um, Putin's getting increasingly desperate. And, of course, one or two commentators have suggested he needs a big gesture in to try to shore up his support now. And that gesture yeah. is like he's come out and sort of lashing out against Ukraine or someone. And, and Robert, that's... What... Yeah, sorry. Forgive me. What do you, what do you make of the issue over the U.S. warning? Because you know we've had some extraordinary U.S. intelligence over the last couple of years. That whole run up to the um, the level of openness through Ukraine, through up to the Ukraine war, and now clearly a warning, particularly to U.S. citizens, of course. Um, yeah. But also a direct you know a direct message to to, to Putin's people that uh, a terror attack could have been considered to be imminent, um, including on a concert or a, or a public event like that. Um, yeah, that, yeah, that, that's an extraordinary statement, by the way, that was posted on the U.S. Embassy in Moscow, mm. I think on the 8th of March. Um, yes, it, what happened was the FSB did successfully 
prevent or thwart an IS, uh, uh, Islamic State uh, attack on a synagogue in Moscow. We do know that. And the Americans got wind of this and they got additional information, which they then posted after the thwarted attack. And I think it was around about the 8th of March they posted mm. this statement um, on the U.S. Embassy website in Moscow, which they actually said that big concerts are going to be a big target in the next few weeks. They're advising American citizens not to attend them. And so there was clearly something there. And uh, Putin, three days before the event, publicly responded to the U.S. intelligence by saying it was a dangerous provocation from the U.S. designed to stabilize his regime, which reminded me of Stalin's response to, uh, I think it was Stafford Cripps's warning just before the Russia, the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union, that you know the British were trying to destabilize uh, the Soviet Union and spoil his wonderful relationship with Adolf Hitler. Yeah. So I mean, this is an extraordinary parallel. So Robert, we have a we have a double header of genuine experts. Today. I mean, it's not normally our our um, skill to have to you know, which we claim expertise, but today we have two genuine experts. Uh, We've got prof and two professors, in fact, Professor Anne Marie Brady and Professor Patman. So we're going to move the conversation a little towards uh, Professor Brady's area of, of specialization in China. Anne Marie, it's wonderful to have you with us. Hi, Marie. Good, uh, good to see you. Uh, Kia Good to see all of you. Um, I'm just going to um, switch my um, iPhone around to picture view. So excuse me for the disorientation and turn off. Yeah. I've so I think it, what, for you all. What, what, while while you do that, Anne Maria, I, I'm also um, really pleased to welcome you in, and and also to uh, just update those people who maybe haven't been following us closely in the last um, six or so years uh, about um, the research that you've done into uh, the um, the role and the extent of uh, China's involvement in politics overseas, and. Um, in particular, uh, I've been focused on this. Um, I'm uh, usually known for my interest in fixed versus floating um, monetary policy, fiscal policy, and um, infrastructure Housing. finance. But, <laughs> but, but there was a time uh, when I was leading the uh, press gallery um, team for Newsroom in in uh, in Wellington when I helped organise a, uh, a joint investigation between Newsroom and the Financial Times into the background of John Young, the national MP. Uh, he's no longer an MP, but uh, that uh, investigation came out at the same time as a seminal paper called Secret Weapons that um, Anne-Marie Brady uh, uh, authored uh, and that was published internationally and I think has helped set the tone actually for a major shift in um, the entire geopolitics. Um, I don't think we would have the same uh, level of uh, um, uh, weariness or or shifting in geopolitics without that um, that information. So, Emery, thank you for that. Um, firstly, I wanted to ask you uh, what was what was your immediate reaction on on hearing this week that the United States, Britain, and New Zealand were calling out China publicly for hacking or for um, uh, its its clearly. Uh, or, uh, arranged or controlled groups hacking into the parliamentary systems in, in those three countries? Well, I might have been one of the um, earliest members of the public to hear about it because I got a woken up from my sleep by um, RNZ to see if I would talk about it. <laughs> and um, when they uh, mentioned what was happening to me, I went and had a look at the UK and US government reports and I could see that they mentioned the International Parliamentary Alliance on China ha um, members haven't been attacked. Well, that's a global alliance. We've got three MPs in our parliament who are part of it. There are um, MPs who are members in, in Europe, Japan, Australia. So I knew that it was a global hack. I'm an advisor to IPAC myself. And um, IPAC has um, constantly warned us to be um, alert to cyber threats from China. So I, I knew that it was going to be huge. Um, I was, I was, I was um, very um, 
pleased to see the very high level political support for this public attribution in New Zealand because what happened was we had the UK and U US uh, statements and then um, by about 8.30 in the morning in New Zealand time there was a statement from our Minister of SIS speaking in solidarity with the UK government and the attacks on their parliament and their electoral commission and, and then doing a public attribution of a cyber attack that New Zealand had experienced on our parliament um, in 2021. Now that's surely not the only cyber attack that China's engaged in, we know that for a fact, there's been some other public attributions, but we've also uh, got SIS and GCSB uh, public statements now increasingly um, since 2018, naming China as a major threat actor for New Zealand. Um, so I think uh, this week we've seen our government confidently um, speak up uh, to China about a matter of national security that targets our democracy and um, was able to, and that our government was able to seek the shelter of other states too who are also speaking up um, and upholding the norm of non-interference, particularly, you know, concerned about the targeting of political institutions. And I note that today Finland has come out and said they were also targeted. Denmark mm -hmm. said that a couple of their MPs were targeted by the same group. Um, Canada has also made a public statement. So um, New Zealand was, um, I think we were the first after the UK and the US government. Um, and for for New Zealand, this is we we have up the ante in terms of our confidence in speaking to China about our concerns and making them public as well. At the same time, of course, last week we had the visit of the Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi, and our government was careful to stress that we would communicate and cooperate as much as we could on on other areas of government, and that's normal diplomacy, of course, uh, but that we were not going to be afraid to raise issues of concern. Do, do you assume, or you all, Robert, in fact, assume that this would have been raised with Wang Yi? Because I, I also wondered whether New Zealand might have actually been bounced into having to say this, uh, having not really wanted it, because it did. New Zealand did seem to be in a bit of a rush to, uh, or a sort of caught slightly off guard, perhaps, on, I think it was Tuesday morning after the British Act, British mm -hmm. and, and American action. I, I, I don't whether... think that's an accurate assumption. I think if you look at the briefing for Minister, um, she was the first time ever we've seen a clear statement about in what cases we make public attribution. And we heard from an interview with Chris Hipkins on RNZ that his government, under his government and then Ardern government um, before, that they had been notified of the incident and that our government agencies were preparing careful uh, evidence to be able to make an attribution. So this is clearly... And then in there, in the advice the minister was telling her what, what she should do when it came time to make a public attribution. So I see a very long trail here. And New Zealand is just acting as other small states like Denmark and Finland, for example, and coming out when there's safety in numbers and doing this public attribution. Um, and the reason why we do so was stated in that document from um, NZSAs and GCSB is when they make public attributions and why. The why, the why is that it's to to just to really to re uh, reinforce the rules of the multilateral uh, in, uh, rules based international order, which underpins the security of the small states more than more than any other states in the world. And um, so, New Zealand, it was said in that information on the public attribution that the reason we go public is to try and. Um, make it clear to the states that aren't um, behaving according to the norms um, that that it's not acceptable and that many other countries in the world want to uphold those norms. So so there's a clearly a long-standing strategy in place here um, that um, New Zealand is working carefully and cautiously with other partners and following also our own well-thought-out strategy. Thank you. So I, I, I wondered, um, thank you, Anne-Marie, I wondered, Robert, um, to bring you in here, uh, what you thought of New Zealand's diplomatic response here and the way that um, 
we registered our protest um the uh calibration of that and and what sort of impact it might have on our relationship with china well as i understand it um the and amri can um correct me but the actual hack occurred three years previously didn't it in 2021 Mm -hmm. um, and I think the New Zealand response, of course, many people in Britain and the UK said, why hasn't New Zealand taken sanctions? Uh, but I think it was quite a forthright confidence statement from uh, the authorities here. Uh, Mr. Peters, it, it, I, I think the issue may have been raised uh, in the visit with Wang Yi and Mr. Peters because it was striking that Mr. Peters, he had a meeting with the journalists, I think, the next day. Uh, certainly for about half an hour he spoke to journalists and one of them ben mckay wrote in the so i think it's the associated press and said that mr peters had warned mr uh, uh, wang yi that new zealand's security concerns were not a figment of their of new yeah. zealand's imagination mm -hmm. and that also uh, that new zealand was deeply concerned about china's assertiveness in uh, the pacific island states but also relating to activities in this country or words to that effect so it, you know it seems to me against that backdrop that the meeting still went relatively well it was described as a friendly but very frank meeting so i suppose in a sense new zealand has gauged uh, both the meeting and also it's been getting all its ducks in a row both with allies and also the evidence and has come up with a, a position which i think is prudent it doesn't rule out if you like, if you know, Mr. Peter's challenge to his foreign policy counter, his foreign minister counterpart in China was this activity must desist and be halted. Uh, if China continues, of course, I think the subtext is that you know, New Zealand will have to consider actions which may be analogous to those taken by the UK and uh, the United States. I think we'd be very reluctant to go down that route. Uh, I, my understanding is, and again, Anne-Marie can correct me here, uh, but my understanding is that New Zealand's trade dependence on China is probably greater than the UK or the US. So we would be probably more reluctant to go down the sanctions route. But I, I think it's very important, as Anne-Marie has said, that we do send the Chinese a very clear message that ultimately we're not going to accept a master-servant relationship with China. Uh, we, we are a liberal democracy and any government, whether it be national-led, or Labour-led, couldn't take a backward step on this issue if China was found to be a, engaging in this sort of uh, cyber intrusions, and particularly on key institutions in the parliamentary you know, democracy, then I don't see how any government could just turn the other cheek and all would be fine. I don't think so. So I think uh, the government has behaved you know, acted quite prudently so far, and it, it, the ball is very much in China's court now. But I, I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm not convinced that China will desist. So um, mm. I anticipate there could be strains ahead, but I'd be very interested to hear Anne-Marie's views on that. So Anne-Marie, do you think we acted strongly enough? Well, New Zealand doesn't have an independent sanctions regime. So um, if we had to pass special legislation to sanction Russia's invasion in, of Ukraine and any states that are assisting um, Russia in its military attacks against Ukraine. So we just don't have the legislation to act in the same way as the US and UK have done unilaterally. <coughs> we work with the UN system. Um, and, you know, this is not the first and it won't be the last cyber attack of China against New Zealand or against other states. However, calling it out is, is important. Um, and we're doing many other things, of course, uh, cyber defence and partnering with states about that, not just working on our own. But um, I would just like to go back to the point that um, Robert raised about um, perceived trade dependency on China. In fact, um, we don't have um, yet, we're not yet at the situation which economists would call a trade dependency with China. I'm really concerned that there is, um, that the media um, is, you know, really um, hyping up this, I've heard massive and enormous mm -hmm. as the adjective used in the last week on our trade with China. That's simply not true. 70% um, of our trade is with the rest of the world. 50% hmm. would be very worrying. We were at 50% when the, when the UK entered the European Commission 
and we our, 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 the basic rule of New Zealand trade uh, diplomacy is never get into that situation ever again. So mm. from 2014, MFAT have had the job of trying very, very hard to diversify our trade away from the China market. Mm -hmm. That became even more acute uh, and important policy from 2018 when there was a big long conversation internally about how to respond to the foreign interference threat that was detailed in my magic letters paper that Bernard mm -hmm. mentioned in the beginning. So the internal conversation in the New Zealand government was economic security or national security. In other words, what are we going to do about it and what might be the risk of economic coercion if we do defend our sovereignty? And the conclusion of that debate was national security trumps economic security. We cannot allow another state to engage in foreign interference in New Zealand. And also we have to be protective of the security of our wider region because it affects us directly too. Mm. So New Zealand's changed its approach to China. It's doing so cautious, cautiously and sensibly. Um, but um, it is... And it has done so successfully. We have not received any um, economic sanctions from China. And I believe we will not um, because we have been sensible. We have been clear um, about uh, maintaining a constructive relationship where it's possible and pointing out issues that are well documented. It's not figments of our imagination and it's not barking up the wrong tree, as the PRC embassy in Wellington wanted to say this week. No, woof, woof. it's well, you know, it's really well um, uh, researched and detailed. There's no doubt about what's going on in New Zealand, as also in our region. Mm. And um, so New Zealand is uh, has been successful in um, having a mature relationship with China and maintaining an independent foreign policy with China and that we will speak our mind when we need to, just as we spoke our mind to the Americans in the 1980s about our anti-nuclear uh, views, and the same with the French in the early 1970s. But it made us unpopular, but we did it because we, we believe that that's who we are as a nation, that we will have our different views, and that we, you know, that's part of, of um, protecting our values as well. So China's foreign interference and its cyber attacks are a challenge to our values but they're also a challenge to national security. And our government has made a decision from 2018 on, it's clearly continued by the coalition government as well, um, that they will that they must, they will and must protect national security. Anne-Marie and maybe Robert, I just, I've got two questions for the, for the end because I'm sure Bernard wants to do a tiny bit the, with the budget at the end on the New Zealand budget. What would you say to those who might say, well, we're all doing it, that the United States is doing exactly the same thing to China, that, uh, you know, and I, I was reading a piece from 2020, December 2023 in the Wall Street Journal, which I imagine you looked at then as well. Um, about the you know the loss ten years ago of a lot of the human intelligence uh, agents inside, inside China that the United States they used been to have. lost they were shot in yes. front of their colleagues right. and the Ministry of State Security accused of being uh, CIA agents. Now what you're talking about there, Peter, is called whataboutism. I know, so, I know. and I'm uh, being very careful US about that. Does not target our Parliament, so we're talking about New Zealand and China here. That's mm -hmm. the situation. So. The U.S. is not an adversary to New Zealand. It's not gauge, engaging in cyber attacks or foreign interference. I mean, far from it. I well remember when I was a student um, and just before the 1990 election, and I was very active in the anti-nuclear movement at the time, and the front page of the Auckland Star was shock horror. Jim Bolger was having lunch with the American Consul General just before the election, and the media wasn't having it. That was interference in our politics. That was the Americans trying to tell Bolger what to do, who could be the next prime minister. So in contrast, our media uh, allows the PRC amb ambassador to tell New Zealand off frequently about policies that we might be thinking about and haven't yet made a decision on. Uh, so this is not at all on the same uh, scale. And we're talking about New Zealand and our sovereignty here. So I think we shouldn't get distracted by other issues. We should focus on our foreign policy and our national security. I might just add to that. I think it's unfortunate that, I mean, I agree with what Anne-Marie says and, uh, you know, absolutely. Uh, but, uh, and I, we have a deep strategic need for uh, international rules-based order where 
uh, we're committed to that and we're committed to strengthening it, not just upholding it, actually strengthening it. Uh, we'd like to see the veto go, and that goes back to Peter Fraser, of course. But uh, I think it's unfortunate that the United States has, mud has clouded uh, the commitment to r the international rules-based order uh, with respect to Gaza, because it's given China and Russia a bit of a propaganda windfall. And I think that's unfortunate uh, that the United States was not more rigorous in, I think, uh, making conditional, making support to Israel conditional after the Hamas attack, uh, conditional upon respect for humanitarian law. And uh, unfortunately, we can't compartmentalize a commitment to the international rules-based system. You can't say, oh, yeah, it's fine to have lawlessness in Gaza, but, of course, we couldn't tolerate it in the Indo-Pacific. I mean, from our point of view, and that's where New Zealand does have a, a quite distinctive worldview and a, a deeper commitment, I believe, to an international rules-based system. But I, I think broadly we've played it right, and uh, hopefully China will re get the message. It's not in China's interest, by the way, to fall out with not just New Zealand but many other Western countries because its economy does depend on exports to some degree on the West. Just finally, Anne-Marie, thank you so much for coming on to the show. Um, I, I wondered uh, how important this week is, in your view, in the New Zealand public's um, understanding of this, um, not just competition, but um, struggle between uh, the, the other members of Five Eyes and ourselves and um, and China and where it goes from here. In terms of things like, are we going to increase our defence spending? Uh, are we going to do more that might actually affect our economy to diversify? I wonder if this is the moment when New Zealanders go, ah, actually, yeah, we, we might need to do something here. Um, well, from having after my paper Magic Weapons became public, uh, many many New Zealanders have reached out to me over the years um, about that and about their concerns on China. So, um, of course, that's a self-selecting audience, but there's quite a lot of them now. Phone calls and emails and approaches in the street and you name it. And I, I it's my observation that um, I think a lot of New Zealanders do have a good understanding about the risk of China to New Zealand. Um, and that it's actually our media that hasn't been very clear. And then there's our business sector have their own reasons um, for, for, for holding particular views. Um, but going back, to, I want to add into um, something that Robert was saying. You know, we know, Robert, in international relations that the great powers do what they want. And we're a small state. And the small, what I've really noticed in the last, uh, especially, you know, the last, well, since 2016, since the Trump presidency, is New Zealand and other small and medium states leaning in close together. This is such a tough time for the small and medium states who rely on the rules-based international mm. order to for our security, um, for the norms, that, and for a fair playing field for everybody, you know, that we can go to uh, the international law and have our rights um, protected. So we know historically that great powers have selectively used the international system and then sometimes set up their parallel systems. That's just, we know that's how it is as, as political scientists. So I'm not, um, I, you know, I think that's the reality. And that's, um, that's why I think New Zealand's doing a really good job working with lots of other small states in, the, in uh, Northern Europe, for example, uh, as well as in Europe, uh, uh, in the Baltics, across the Pacific. Um, to try and and then also with non-traditional partners like Vietnam, for example, and Indonesia mm. and India to shore up the, a global support for the rules-based international order, which is not just about the democracies. Mm. So it's a tough time and um, the great powers are acting like they tend to do, which is might is right. Well, we consider you and Robert to be great powers on our on our show. So we'd, we'd love to have you on every week. Uh, and there's probably gin in it for you if you're if you're fortunate. But yeah. thanks so much for coming. And I know you've um, you've you've had some some concerns. I, I will actually I'm going to write back to you and see if we can talk at some point about the media questions that you raised because I I also found a, something you'd written last year about that. And I, I think it is a really important area about how deeply we cover and or shallowly we cover some of these things.
Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, Robert. Good to see you. Thank you. Robert. Thank you. Have a lovely. Lovely. Try and have a lovely weekend. Yes, have a lovely yes. Easter, everyone. Thank you. And Bernard, um, you're going to do a little the... short soliloquy, I think, on the budget now, right? Yes, but very one brief one on the media. Um, oh yeah. Okay. I I um, appreciate Anne Marie's uh, comments about the uh, the relative slowness and maybe not the depth of coverage uh, in the New Zealand media about China's uh, actions and our potential role in it. And I'm proud, actually, uh, that over the last um, uh, eight years or so, um, I've gone out of my way and uh, employed people, uh, uh, played a role in employing Sam Sustiva as a, uh, a full-time foreign uh, correspondent based in the press gallery covering these issues drove helped drive the coverage uh, of um, magic weapons and the case of Jian Yang and uh, have been really proud that in the last uh, three years now on the Hoon we have spent a lot of time covering foreign affairs which we have and trying to avoid what about us at all, all costs but yep. yeah yeah and um, I'm 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 really proud of that and and I'll keep keep doing it i'm also grateful to people like Anne marie uh and robert who you know you know go out of their way um to call out uh stuff and sometimes it's painful uh for those who knows about some of the you know the, the way things work um it is not personally painless to contest what china does in new zealand and uh there are consequences and certainly um, have been for they certainly have been for Anne marie yeah yeah and uh and i admire people who who uh put their head above the parapet like that um i like to think i've done a bit of that myself and uh it requires um some some strength of uh, uh will and also resources so i think you're right peter to to raise this just finally um talking of soliloquies and um views of the world uh, this week, the government released its budget policy statement, and if you're looking for a, a more in-depth um, view on what this means, I, I recommend my own podcast from this morning. But uh, we now have a government that has committed itself again to tax cuts worth $14.9 billion, but that has also learnt in the last week that the deterioration in the, con the economy you could argue partially a result of the government's actions, uh, is, is going to mean $14.9 billion less revenue for the government, which means going ahead with these tax cuts does involve the government borrowing $15 billion to do it. These are debt-funded tax cuts. There's no question about it now. You could have argued um, before we got these new forecasts that the government is going to cut spending elsewhere and raise a few taxes here and it's all going to be neutral. But now that we know that um, there's $15 billion less in other taxes coming into the economy, because we know that the size of the economy is going to be about $43 billion smaller, um, there is no excuse. And you're hearing that now from the likes of the New Zealand Initiative, uh, from John Key and directly and from Richard Pribble saying to the government, yeah, we like tax cuts, but you can't do it in the middle of a recession and you can't borrow money to do it. And uh, I was really surprised yesterday that this wasn't called out. I wanted to see our correspondents jump up and call bullshit on um, the government's claim. And it was repeated again by Nicola Willis yesterday that these were not debt funded tax cuts. They are. And um, I suspect there are plenty on the fiscally conservative side of politics who are behind the scenes calling bullshit on it too. And uh, we'll see how that goes. So between Bernard, now what and will the consequences be for the currency and the bond market? None. In fact, there was a really big um, uh, bond issue today, which went off just fine. The bond markets have absolutely no issue with um, the management of the uh, finances of the government. Again, and I've said this before, the uh, performative um, calling out by the current government of um, so-called fiscal irresponsibility by Labour was just simply not true. Otherwise, there would have been market reactions. There wasn't. And I think this is it, it, it was dangerous to muck around with this stuff before the election, saying things that simply weren't true. And now after the election, to try it again, 
um, is dangerous when you're the finance minister. And, you know, we, we do want people in the financial markets to listen to our finance ministers when it's required. And the danger here is that yeah. we have um, people crying wolf. And uh, when the wolf does arrive, the markets are not willing to listen. And uh, that's why I think uh, the government should reconsider its uh, tax cuts. And that's why I think um, there's a good chance by May 30, they won't be the 14.9 billion that the government promised before the election and to right. And it should re look again, of course, at some of the more um, egregious and painful spending cuts. There is no such thing as only a back office cost and only a front office cost. Mm. The idea, the framing of it is just plain ludicrous. And um, we're starting to see that already with the, uh, the um, uh, awful example in disability um, services mm. and uh, respite care. So... Here end of the soliloquy. Nice one. <laughs> two, two soliloquies in one. Brilliant, Bernard. Thank you. Uh, I'll see you on. Um, I'll see you before next Thursday, but I will uh, go and have um, fish and chips at our usual place this evening. Uh, and I wish, wish I, was, I was with you. I wish I was there. Wish yeah. I was there. I, and I, thank you, I, everybody. I and uh, I really appreciate having Robert and uh, the brilliant Anne Marie on. Kaki Have a great weekend, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.